Thank you all for joining us this morning. Welcome back to the Cary Scientific Seminar Series. Uh, I'm Shannon Ledoux, a scientist at Cary, and I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Elsa Anderson, who uh, started us off last week as host and, and introduced the seminar series again, and welcomed you all back. You can find us here every Thursday at 11, except next Thursday, we are not having a seminar. As you can see on the screen, September 23rd, we do not have a seminar. Um, but please do come back on the 30th to hear from Dr. Angela Possinger, who is going to be talking about soil carbon vulnerability and environmental change. Um, a couple of logistics. If you're having um, challenges, please use the chat tab at the bottom of your screen, or at the bottom of my screen, um, it, to volume any, any issues that, that you think we can help you with, please put there. Um, and also, if you're joining us from somewhere outside of Millbrook um, or the, the local Dutchess County area or, or anywhere really and want to say hi, please go ahead and put your name there and let us know where you're joining from. Questions that you would like our speaker to address at the end of the talk, please add those to the Q&A, which again is at a tab down at the bottom of the screen. Um, you'll be able to see your question. You won't be able to see other people's questions. Um, but I will be able to see them all and we will address them at the end of the talk. Okay, so, great. So it looks like people have found those. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Mary Lofton, who is joining us from uh, Virginia Tech in um, Virginia. And, uh, and I, you know, it's, it's a real pleasure to welcome Mary to the Cary Scientific Seminar Series. Um, she's been somebody who I've had the pleasure of working with for, for the last several years, um, but is right now currently uh, a postdoctoral associate in a, in a fairly new position at, at Virginia Tech, um, working more specifically on, on the forecasting uh, protocols and, and applications and development that, uh, that she's been, been increasingly involved in uh, in, the, in the last several years. And Dr. Lofton is a freshwater ecologist uh, and has done research broadly that addresses ecosystem functions um, to ensure safe drinking water. And a lot of that field work has largely been conducted in, in reservoirs and, and to the places where, where our drinking water comes from, but many of us probably don't visit regularly. And as such, uh, Dr. Lofton's research has really been um, at that intersection, engaging decision makers and managers at that local scale. Um, but I became familiar with Mary's work and had the opportunity to work with her as she became more engaged in forecasting and, and predicting forward into the future uh, conditions, both in response to small disturbances and, and in response to climate change and, and more global uh, level disturbances. And I've been incredibly impressed at how, uh, how quickly and, and deeply Dr. Lofton has been able to uh, master the, the statistical skills and, and really become a statistician doing ecological forecasting, which is really exciting to watch somebody. Uh, it's, it's an exciting path to watch somebody travel and I've been very impressed. And so today, um, again, she has just started her postdoctoral work. So my guess is we're gonna hear a lot more about the um, PhD work uh, that, that she has done. And I, I look forward to hearing it. And without further ado, Mary, take it off. Thank you. I'm just gonna share my screen here really quickly. Okay, um, please do let me know if you're having any trouble with viewing, but otherwise I'm gonna press on. So hi everyone, thank you hi, so much. Hi Mary, Mary, I'm oh, sorry gosh. to interrupt. I'm right now, I'm seeing the presenter view. Oh, you are, okay, let's try this again. Thank let's you. Try this again, thanks. Sure thing. So we did test this and it wasn't an issue last time. So hang on just a sec. Mm -hmm. All 
right. And then here. See here. That looks good. Okay, that's better. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Um, so first, thank you everyone for joining me today. I really appreciate it. And thank you to the Cary Institute and especially Shannon and Matt Gillespie for coordinating this seminar. Um, I'm happy to be here. So before we begin, I do want to note as, as Dr. Ledoux uh, guessed, much of what I'll be presenting today is my PhD dissertation work. And because of that, I have many, many people to thank because as some of you will appreciate, it takes a village to get a PhD in ecosystem science. So I have pictures here of field crews, authors, collaborators, um, mentors, committee members, and family who each played an important role in supporting my dissertation work. Um, I'd like to point out Dr. Kaylin Carey, my advisor at Virginia Tech, as well as members of the Virginia Tech Reservoir Research Team who were critical boots on the ground support for some of the research in Virginia reservoirs that I'll talk about. And I'd also like to point out that several of the folks pictured here are affiliated with Cary, namely Shannon Ledoux, Kathleen Weathers, and Lisa Bore. And through involvement with organizations such as the Global Lake Ecological Observatory Initiative or Network and the Ecological Forecasting Initiative, as well as just being awesome folks who seek out opportunities to support um, early career researchers, they've had a tremendous influence on my PhD work and graduate student experience. So I have a lot of appreciation and gratitude for Carrie and for the research that it supports. So let's begin. So I'm gonna start by orienting you a bit. I'm gonna begin by introducing some key concepts that have helped me frame my research over the past few years. And so for the next few minutes, I'll be developing that conceptual framework on the left-hand side of each slide here while the right-hand side will primarily be used for supporting examples or research findings that map onto this framework. And I'll be returning to the conceptual figure on the left throughout the talk. My research focuses on the relationship between environmental heterogeneity and community structure, which is a fundamental relationship in ecology. And I'm defining environmental heterogeneity as variability in, for example, food resources, climate, predator pressure or physical habitat structure over space and time, while community structure includes both community distribution or how species are distributed across space, as well as community structure composition or the presence and absence or relative abundance of species over time. And importantly, the interaction of environmental heterogeneity and community structure is mediated by traits which I'm defining as physiological, morphological, behavioral, or life history characteristics of a species or group of species. And we expect that organisms with traits better suited to current environmental conditions will thrive, while organisms with unfavorable traits will not. So for example, freshwater phytoplankton communities uh, undergo a predictable seasonal succession in temperate lakes each year where cold waters in the spring favor diatoms, which grow well at cold temperatures, while warm waters in the summer favor blue-green algae or cyanobacteria, which grow well at warm temperatures. Importantly, traits also drive feedbacks between community structure and environmental heterogeneity. So for example, the ability of cyanobacteria to form buoyant, dense surface scums at the water's surface affects the underwater light environment throughout the rest of the water column. And so as we attempt to understand this interaction between environmental heterogeneity and community structure, consideration of multiple temporal and spatial scales can yield separate but complementary insights. And so I've listed here some of the temporal and spatial scales I've used in my recent research, but of course there are others. So for example, integration of the freshwater phytoplankton seasonal succession I just mentioned with climate in different global ecoregions has led to development of multiple scenarios, possible scenarios of phytoplankton seasonal succession in lakes and reservoirs around the world. And today, the contemporary ecologist challenge is to explain and predict this interaction between environmental heterogeneity and community structure in a rapidly changing world. So whether it's through climate warming, increased frequency and intensity of storms or wildfires or land use change among other factors, global change exposes communities to multiple stressors at multiple scales. 
For example, increased air temperature can both shift a species life history phenology at the seasonal scale and their inhabited spatial ranges at the multi-decadal scale. And these types of complex responses to global change make it difficult to predict how global change stressors will affect important ecological communities. My research focuses on lake and reservoir phytoplankton as a focal system for disentangling these global change effects on community structure. Freshwater phytoplankton are essential to lake and reservoir ecosystem function, but also have the potential to grow out of control and form harmful blooms, which can have deleterious effects on water quality. And in addition, the freshwater ecosystems they inhabit are some of the most threatened under global change due to, for example, nutrient pollution from fertilizer runoff, sediment pollution from erosion due to land use change, brownification or increased water color due to increased dissolved organic carbon in the water, and altered thermal dynamics um, due to both increased water temperature and changes in thermal stratification, which is the temperature gradient between the warm surface waters and the cool bottom waters. And furthermore, there's evidence that these global change stressors are affecting phytoplankton community structure by causing an increase in the prevalence of harmful phytoplankton blooms and the taxa that cause them. And this leads to undesirable effects on water quality, including fish kills due to depleted oxygen, decreased food quality for zooplankton, or release of harmful toxins, among others. So as a result, there's a pressing need to better understand global change effects on these freshwater phytoplankton communities. However, there is also a lot of uncertainty surrounding phytoplankton responses to global change. And specifically, the research I'll be presenting today focuses on three knowledge gaps. First, the relative importance of environmental drivers of phytoplankton biomass distribution across depth, as well as the interaction between these depth distributions and community structure. So a lot of research has focused on surface blooms of phytoplankton, but we know that phytoplankton biomass varies throughout the water column. And I'm really interested in exploring the drivers and patterns of that variability. And additionally, I'm interested in exploring the drivers of short-term variability in phytoplankton temporal dynamics, which are notoriously difficult to predict as blooms can arise and disappear suddenly. So to address these knowledge gaps, I'm interested in the following overarching question, which is how does phytoplankton community structure interact with spatial and temporal heterogeneity in lakes and reservoirs? And today I'll be presenting four complementary studies to hopefully help answer this question. So first, we'll analyze snapshot survey data from 51 lakes in Quebec province to identify how phytoplankton depth distributions are affected by variables such as water temperature, light, nutrients, and zooplankton grazing. And using this regional survey as a space for time substitution, we can infer phytoplankton depth distribution responses to global change stressors, such as brownification or increased thermal stratification. Second, we'll look at whole ecosystem experiments during both a single summer and over the course of multiple years to determine the effects of surface water mixing on phytoplankton community composition as well as the relationship between biomass depth distributions and community composition of phytoplankton. And these whole ecosystem experiments were um, specifically designed to simulate the effects of increased frequency and intensity of storms under global change. And finally, uh, as, as Dr. Ledoux alluded to, we'll move from an explanatory to a predictive framework, identifying the dominant sources of uncertainty in one to four week forecasts of phytoplankton density. And the aim of this study was to improve near-term phytoplankton predictions um, with the eventual hope of um, improving water resource management. So together, these studies provide insight on how global change affects phytoplankton communities at multiple temporal and spatial scales. So I'm gonna start by sharing a study focused on the relationship between spatial environmental heterogeneity at the regional scale and the spatial community distribution of phytoplankton across depth in the water column using re regional variability in lake characteristics as a space for time uh, substitution of a gradient of global change stressors. So when we think about where phytoplankton exist in the water column, we often focus on the fact that because they are photosynthetic, they need light to grow and thrive. And because light enters the water column from above and attenuates with depth, 
This could lead us to expect that phytoplankton biomass would be highest at shallow depths and then decrease as depth increases, as shown in this algal biomass depth profile. However, in the field, we often observe a different phenomenon in which phytoplankton biomass is highest at a depth well below the water surface. And this phenomenon known as a deep chlorophyll maximum or DCM is found in lakes throughout the world. So how do these DCMs or deep chlorophyll maxima form? So from previous research, we expect that phytoplankton will try to optimize their depths in the water column to simultaneously take advantage of warm temperatures and incoming light, which they need, as well as access nutrients, which they also need. So in the case of temperature, the water tends to be warmest at the surface and then becomes cooler as you go deeper into the water. And the boundary between these warm and cool layers is referred to as the thermocline. Similarly, the amount of available light tends to be highest at the water surface and to decrease with depth. On the other hand, many nutrients show the opposite pattern where concentrations are fairly low in the surface waters and higher below the thermocline. So as a result, there is some region in the middle of the water column that should be optimal for phytoplankton growth. And um, in addition, phytoplankton depth distributions can also be affected by zooplankton grazing, where if zooplankton are grazing down biomass in a particular region of the water column, phytoplankton biomass would be reduced in that region. And importantly, if these gradients of light, temperature, zooplankton, and nutrients change, we would also expect the optimal zone for phytoplankton to change. The second important point here is that we don't necessarily expect the optimal depth to be the same for all phytoplankton. So for example, many green algae taxa prefer relatively high light environments to grow. So we would expect their optimal zone to maybe be closer to the surface, potentially here. On the other hand, many brown algae taxa, such as chrysophytes or golden algae, dinoflagellates or diatoms, can metabolize organic matter in addition to performing photosynthesis and are also pretty nutritious from a zooplankton's perspective. So we might expect their optimum depth to be deeper, either because they're accessing organic matter settled at the thermocline or because they've been grazed down by zooplankton at shallower depths. However, there have not been many empirical tests of these expectations. So this brings us to our focal question for this study, which is what's the relative importance of light, nutrients, thermal stratification, and zooplankton grazing on phytoplankton vertical biomass distributions in north temperate lakes during the summer stratified period? And secondarily, how does the importance of these factors vary among phytoplankton groups? So to address these questions, we used a data set collected by B. Beisner's lab at the University of Quebec at Montreal. B's lab conducted an impressive snapshot sampling survey of 51 lakes in July 2004-2005 in Quebec province, which is at the height of thermal stratification in July. So these lakes were selected to span gradients of nutrients, water color, lake area, and lake depth. And at each lake, a phytoplankton sensor was used to take biomass depth profiles of four groups, green algae, brown algae, cyanobacteria, and cryptophytes, as well as total biomass. And in addition, the Beisner lab measured light attenuation, thermal stratification, nutrients, and zooplankton abundance at each lake, and also collected phytoplankton samples from each lake to ground truth their sensor data. So first, I'd like to show you where the lakes were located and demonstrate that we did find deep chlorophyll maxima in many of these lakes. As you can see, um, by the color of the hexagon representing each lake site that the majority of lakes had one or more DCM. And for this study, we were defining deep chlorophyll maxima as a biomass maximum below the top 10% of the water column. Second, I'd like to show you that the lakes did in fact span gradients of light attenuation, which is shown on the left-hand side of this series of box plots, as well as thermal stratification, nutrients represented here by total nitrogen, and zooplankton abundance. And importantly, these gradients can be used as a proxy for global change stressors, as light attenuation could increase with brownification under global change, and thermal stratification and nutrients are also predicted to increase. So to analyze our data, we calculated two characteristics of phytoplankton depth distributions for each of the four phytoplankton groups and total biomass at each lake. So we calculated the depth of maximum biomass as well as the width of the biomass peak, 
And I'd like to give a quick shout out to Taylor Leach here for really shaping my thinking about vertical distributions and helping to develop some of the nitty gritty behind these methods. We then used a regression tree analysis to determine which environmental variables were most important in determining different characteristics of the deep chlorophyll maximum. So we ran regression trees for each of our response variables and our candidate drivers were light, nutrients, stratification, and zooplankton abundance. So what do we find? Here, I'm showing you the thermally stratified water column schematic we talked through earlier, and I'm going to map our actual data onto it. So on the y-axis is depth standardized across our study lakes with the surface water at the top of the y-axis and the sediments at the bottom. And on the x-axis is a probability density function for peak depth, so peak biomass depth across all 51 study lakes. And here is the standardized depth of the thermocline that was most commonly observed across lakes. First, we found that green algae had the shallowest peak depths and that their vertical distributions were most strongly explained by light attenuation and thermal stratification. This made sense to us as many green algae taxa prefer high light environments and also many of these taxa are modal. So in thermally stratified conditions, modal taxa we expect can migrate up and down through the water column to attain their optimal depth. Next, we found that brown algae had somewhat deeper biomass peaks and that their vertical depth distributions were primarily associated with zooplankton, which makes sense as these are highly nutritious taxa that are likely responding to zooplankton grazing pressure. Cyanobacteria had even deeper biomass maxima, often near the thermocline, and their vertical distributions were associated with thermal stratification. So while we often think of cyanobacteria as surface dwelling, this result actually makes sense for this suite of relatively low nutrient lakes, um, with some high nutrient lakes included, as many of the cyanobacteria we observed across these lakes are low light tolerant and able to regulate their buoyancy, which allows them to maintain their position at an optimal depth in sort of the low light conditions where they can thrive. Finally, we found that cryptophytes also had deep biomass maxima, and their vertical distributions were associated with thermal stratification and zooplankton abundance. This made sense to us as these taxa tend to be low light tolerant, fairly nutritious to zooplankton, and are also modal, allowing them to migrate to their preferred optimal depth in stratified conditions. So importantly, our results also demonstrated that global change stressors may alter phytoplankton depth distributions. Specifically, we found that higher thermal stratification led to shallower, narrower biomass peaks across several phytoplankton groups. And we also found that higher light attenuation, such as might occur with increased brownification, altered peak width, leading to narrower total biomass peaks, but wider peaks in green algae. So to briefly summarize this study, we found that spatial uh, heterogeneity in some of these environmental drivers did affect phytoplankton depth distributions. And we felt that the traits of these different phytoplankton groups could be linked to the relative importance of these drivers. Finally, we found that global change stressors may affect phytoplankton depth distributions. And I was really excited about this because this represents sort of a new dimension of potential global change effects on phytoplankton communities where global change is not just affecting the magnitude of biomass or the taxa that are present, but also the way that biomass and those taxa are distributed across depth in the water. So in the study I just presented, we used regional variability in lake characteristics as a proxy for global change stressors. However, this approach may not accurately represent the effects of change that occurs over time in a single system. So next, we chose to focus on the effects of a single stressor, which was changes in thermal stratification by conducting whole ecosystem experiments in a small reservoir. And because these experiments are the basis of the next two studies, I'm going to introduce the motivation, the study system, and the experiments and methods first, and then hone in on the results and driving questions from each study. So as I mentioned previously, the interaction of multiple global change stressors is complex. And the benefit of a whole ecosystem experimental approach is that it allows us to isolate a subset of these factors and study them at a real world scale, in this case, an entire lake or reservoir. So what we decided to focus on was the potential effects of increased frequency and intensity of storms under global change. And storms are associated with high winds, 
high rainfall or both. But because we cannot simulate precipitation at the whole ecosystem scale yet, the manipulations we conducted were most closely analogous to the effects of storm-related wind events. And wind can affect in-lake characteristics in a number of ways. So first, wind action in shallow water can increase suspended sediment in the water, which can affect the amount of light available in the water column or introduce nutrients, thus affecting two important resources for phytoplankton. Additionally, wind can also cause water column mixing, which can entrain nutrients from below the thermocline or disrupt or decrease thermal stratification, which is also important for phytoplankton. To simulate these storm effects, the Virginia Tech Reservoir Research Group conducted whole ecosystem experiments in Falling Creek Reservoir, a small drinking water reservoir in Vinton, Virginia, in Southwest Virginia, owned and operated by the Western Virginia Water Authority. Importantly, Falling Creek has an engineered water mixing system installed, which is comprised of an onshore air compressor coupled to a diffuser line. And when activated, this system injects bubbles through the top half of the water column, effectively mixing the surface waters. And you can see the extent of the mixing system shown here in the black line, by the black line in the map on the left. So we conducted five short, intense mixing events over the course of two years to simulate storm-induced mixing. And we also conducted intensive weekly sampling in the summers of 2016 to 2019 to monitor the effects of mixing on physical, chemical, and biological variables. We collected a total biomass depth profile of phytoplankton across the water column at the deepest site in the reservoir as well as a grab sample at the depth of biomass maximum for identification of phytoplankton genera under the microscope. And we also sampled for a suite of physical chemical variables that would allow us to assess the effects of mixing at the whole ecosystem scale. So now I'm gonna share with you some of the outcomes of this field campaign. So I'm gonna start by focusing in on the first two mixing manipulations that we conducted during a single summer. And our focus during this study was assessing the effects of environmental heterogeneity created by our mixing manipulations on phytoplankton community composition at the weekly scale. So how would we expect surface water mixing to affect phytoplankton? To start, here's the thermally stratified water column I showed you before, representing a lake in the summertime. Now here is the same water column during or shortly after a storm event where wind and rain action has caused surface water mixing, homogenizing the temperature in the surface waters. Previous research suggests that these two water columns could favor different types of phytoplankton, where strongly stratified conditions are thought to favor certain colonial cyanobacteria, which take advantage of the stratification via their buoyancy to form surface scums in the warm temperature highlight environment they prefer. On the other hand, mixed conditions are thought to benefit smaller, denser silica-containing taxa, such as some brown or green algae, which would sink out of the photic zone where light is available under stratified conditions, but do better in mixed conditions as they are kept suspended where light is available. And our mixing experiments provided us the opportunity to test these expectations at the whole ecosystem scale. So our driving questions for this study were first, how does mixing affect total biomass and phytoplankton functional groups at the whole ecosystem scale? And secondly, how do physical and chemical variables mediate these phytoplankton responses? And we address these questions by analyzing two mixing events that happened about a month apart in late spring and summer 2016. So first I wanna show you that our mixing manipulations did affect thermal stratification as intended. So mixing events shown here by the gray vertical lines caused an increase in the depth of the thermocline and also decreased the strength of thermal stratification. Second, we found that the response of total biomass throughout the surface waters to mixing was inconsistent. After the first mixing event on May 30th, biomass increased in our study reservoir, while after the second mixing event, biomass neither increased nor decreased. And when we dug into our physical chemical data, it became clear that this increase in phytoplankton biomass after the first mixing event coincided with a significant increase in turbidity and total phosphorus at our sampling site, as well as a decrease in soluble reactive phosphorus 
and the ratio of soluble reactive phosphorus to total phosphorus at the depth of chlorophyll maximum, suggesting that phytoplankton were taking up available phosphorus at this depth. So in sum, we interpreted these results to indicate that mixing led to an increase in suspended sediment at our sampling site, thereby potentially providing a nutrient subsidy that stimulated phytoplankton growth. Importantly, however, this only occurred after our first mixing event in late May, suggesting that the seasonal timing of storm-driven mixing matters. So for example, an early season mixing event might be more likely to entrain muddy or turbid upstream water as spring can be associated with higher rainfall and runoff here in Virginia. And this phenomenon might not be observed later in the summer when rainfall is lower. Finally, I'd like to show you how phytoplankton community composition was affected by mixing. So for this study, we determined the proportion of phytoplankton that fell into different morphology-based functional groups because the morphological traits of phytoplankton are thought to be um, important for determining their mixing response. So I'm gonna focus here on three groups, small silica containing flagellates, large high surface area to volume ratio filaments, and small and medium sized taxa with and without flagella because these groups most closely represent the functional groups I showed you in the schematic earlier. So if we look at a time series of phytoplankton biovolume across both of our mixing events, you can see that the small silica containing flagellates increase substantially after each mixing event and that large high surface area to volume filaments decrease post mixing. And this is consistent with our expectations from previous research. However, I'd like you to note the difference in the y axis scales between these two groups. Small silica containing flagellates were never dominant in our study reservoir. So decreases in large filaments meant that dominance shifted to small and medium-sized green algae taxa post-mixing. You might also notice that large filaments recover very quickly after our first mixing event, and we attributed that recovery to the turbidity-induced nutrient subsidy that I just described. So to summarize this study, we found that mixing had predictable effects on morphological groups, but not on total biomass. And our results indicated that the seasonal timing of extreme storm events is likely important for phytoplankton response. And finally, our study emphasizes the utility of this whole ecosystem approach to identify complex interactions among ecosystem variables in response to global change stressors, as there's no way we could have evaluated the effects of mixing on ecosystem variables like turbidity without a whole ecosystem approach. So following on the results of the two studies I just presented, I became really interested in the relationship between the spatial distribution of phytoplankton biomass across depth and phytoplankton community composition. And specifically, I was interested in how changes in thermocline depth would affect this depth distribution community composition relationship. So previous research suggests that deepening of the thermocline, such as we caused in Falling Creek Reservoir with our mixing manipulations, could result in two possible outcomes for phytoplankton depth distributions. So first, the phytoplankton biomass peak might deepen as phytoplankton shift with the thermocline to take advantage of nutrients that are entrained from below it. Or alternatively, the mixing action that causes thermocline deepening might homogenize phytoplankton biomass across the surface waters. And following previous findings, I also thought that these changes in depth distributions over time might be associated with changes in community composition. So this led to our research questions, which were how do phytoplankton depth distribution and community composition change in response to thermocline deepening at the multi-annual scale? And also how do physical and chemical variables mediate these responses? So to address these questions, we analyzed data from four summers in Falling Creek Reservoir, where two summers had either two or three short intense mixing manipulations to deepen the thermocline, and two summers had no manipulations. To assess the effect of thermocline deepening on phytoplankton depth distributions, we used the same distribution metrics that we used in our study of Quebec lakes. However, for this study, we focused on the depth distributions of phytoplankton and nutrients in the photic zone or the region of the water column where light availability is considered adequate for phytoplankton growth. We then conducted a three-part analysis of our data. 
So first, we assess the effects of thermocline deepening at the multi-annual scale using Anderson Darling tests to see if distributions of physical, chemical, and biological variables were different during manipulation and reference years. Second, we use time series models to look at drivers of phytoplankton uh, depth distributions over time. And third, we use multivariate ordinations to assess changes in community composition at the depth of maximum phytoplankton biomass over time. So what do we find? According to Anderson Darling tests, we found that our manipulations deepen the thermocline by over a meter in years with mixing events compared to reference years, and that thermal stratification was also significantly weaker in manipulation years. We also found that the depth of maximum soluble reactive phosphorus in the photic zone was deeper in manipulation years. And finally, we found that the depth of peak phytoplankton biomass was deepened by over a meter in manipulation compared to reference years, supporting our first alternative hypothesis that deeper thermoclines would lead to deeper biomass peaks. When we analyze the drivers of peak biomass depth in reference and manipulation years, we found that during reference years, peak biomass or peak depth was primarily driven by light attenuation, as well as by thermal stratification and the depths of maximum soluble reactive phosphorus and dissolved organic carbon in the photic zone. However, in manipulation years, the primary drivers of peak depth were thermocline depth, thermal stratification, and the depth of maximum soluble reactive phosphorus in the photic zone, all of which were significantly affected by our manipulations, as I showed you on the previous slide, indicating that our manipulations fundamentally changed the drivers of peak biomass depth. So, so far, our results indicate that at the multi-annual scale, storm-induced thermocline deepening can affect phytoplankton biomass by altering thermal stratification, which in turn affects the depth distributions of nutrients and deepens the depth of peak phytoplankton biomass. Finally, when we conducted multivariate ordinations on phytoplankton community composition uh, data, we found that phytoplankton community composition was different between deep and shallow biomass peaks. Some of these associations made sense according to functional traits. For example, a high light loving buoyant cyanobacterial taxon was associated with shallow peaks, while a cryptophyte taxon that can metabolize organic matter at the thermocline was associated with deep peaks. Other associations were not as intuitive. So for example, two other taxa capable of metabolizing organic matter were associated with shallow peaks. And to me, this suggested that interspecific interactions could potentially be important for community composition at the biomass maximum. For example, maybe these two taxa were metabolizing organic matter um, released by degradation of large cyanobacterial filaments in these shallow peaks. So in sum, we found that phytoplankton depth distribution and community composition were related, and that both environmental drivers and potentially interspecific interactions um, are important for biomass peak formation. Importantly, our findings demonstrate that thermocline deepening altered the drivers of phytoplankton spatial distributions, providing further support that global change stressors can affect phytoplankton spatial distributions in addition to abundance and community composition. Okay, so up to this point, we've done a lot of explanatory work, but to address global change concerns, we need to be able to operate in a predictive framework. It's beneficial to both water resource managers and the general public, not to just have a picture of what water quality is currently like, but also to have an understanding of what it might look like next week or next month. And so this next study was intentionally conducted in a predictive framework to highlight some of the challenges of near-term phytoplankton predictions and to hopefully suggest some possible next steps for improving them. As I've mentioned, predicting phytoplankton responses to global change is highly uncertain. Let's take, for example, the effect of increased air temperature on future phytoplankton communities. There is uncertainty in how much future air temperatures will increase, and there is uncertainty in the relationship between increased air temperature and lake water temperature, leading to uncertainty in future lake water temperatures. Then there's uncertainty in the relationship between lake water temperature and future phytoplankton communities, which leads to even more uncertainty in future phytoplankton communities. So clearly this uncertainty is coming from multiple sources. 
And if we can understand which source the majority of the uncertainty is coming from, we can figure out where to target our efforts to reduce this uncertainty and hopefully improve phytoplankton prediction. So for this analysis, we focused on four types of uncertainty. Process uncertainty, which is uncertainty in the model structure. For example, the form of equation you are using to specify the relationship between lake water temperature and phytoplankton. Parameter uncertainty, which is uncertainty in the parameters of your model. For example, the intercept term of a linear regression. Driver uncertainty, which is uncertainty in the input variables to your model. For example, water temperature in this case. On initial conditions uncertainty or uncertainty in the current true state of phytoplankton in a lake that you are using as the starting point for your future predictions. To analyze the relative importance of these sources of uncertainty to phytoplankton forecasts, we needed a long term data set of phytoplankton abundance. And there was a group of researchers, uh, ecological researchers at Lake Sunapee, New Hampshire, that it turned out had a perfect data set for this study that they were willing to share. So um, Lake Sunapee is a large, low nutrient lake. And since 2005, a group of researchers known informally as the GLEO gang has been collecting weekly densities of Gliotrichia acinulata, which is a cyanobacterium at several near shore sites on this lake. Uh, so I always like to quote Kathy Cottingham here. She will, she's one of the data providers and she will tell you that Gliotrichia is a particularly good example of charismatic microflora or a bit of a weird critter compared to most cyanobacteria, primarily because it occurs in low nutrient lakes, which goes against our intuition that cyanobacteria should primarily occur in lakes experiencing nutrient pollution. So we really had to think about which environmental variables might be important for driving the abundance of this weird critter based on its functional traits. So our first question was, which environmental covariates best predict cyanobacterial density in a low nutrient lake over one to four weeks in the future? And by leveraging the expertise of the GLEO gang, we decided to focus primarily on physical drivers, such as wind, rain, water temperature, thermal stratification, solar radiation, and so on. And our second question was, what are the dominant sources of uncertainty in cyanobacterial forecasts? so that we could make inferences about how to improve our GLEO predictions. To address these questions, we developed a suite of models of varying complexity and using different physical covariates to predict GLEO density one to four weeks into the future. We were able to estimate the uncertainty associated with our predictions by modeling each potential source of uncertainty as a distribution. So rather than calibrating our models to estimate a single parameter value, we estimated a distribution of possible parameter values. And instead of using a single estimate of future water temperatures as input for our GLEO forecasts, we drew from an ensemble of possible future water temperatures. And this allowed us to estimate the uncertainty associated with each component of our one to four week hindcasts for each model. So first, which models perform best? At the one week horizon, the best performing model was a simple linear model that said, uh, next week's GLEO density is a linear function of this week's GLEO density plus some process area. So no uh, covariates improved forecast performance over this simple model at the one week horizon. However, at the four week horizon, addition of both water temperature and wind covariates improved forecast performance over our simple null model. And the dominant source of uncertainty across all models at all time horizons was process uncertainty. So here I'm showing our best performing model at the four week horizon, but results from other models were similar. And this indicates that even though we had considered several different model structures for predicting GLEO densities, and even though wind and water temperatures seemed promising as potential predictor variables, we still had more work to do to improve our model structure. Based on the traits of this particular cyanobacterium, um, logical next steps for model development might include addition of a life history stage or a model structure that uh, allows state switching where glio densities can be triggered to switch from a low density, low uncertainty state to a high density, high uncertainty state. So to summarize, we found that we needed better representation of short-term ecological processes in phytoplankton models to improve our predictions. 
and that consideration of the traits of our focal cyanobacterium was really helpful in guiding both model development and interpretation of our results to improve future models. Finally, our findings suggest that global change could affect cyanobacteria in low nutrient lakes via changes in water temperature, since that was an important predictor variable in our four-week models. So in reflecting back over this suite of studies, there are several overarching take-homes that I'd like to highlight. First, this research emphasizes that traits link environmental heterogeneity and community structure, and that consideration of traits is critical to understanding community environment interactions. Findings from each study support this conclusion. So in a survey study of Quebec lakes, we found that the relative importance of environmental drivers of depth distributions differed among phytoplankton groups according to their functional traits. Whole ecosystem mixing manipulations revealed that temporal heterogeneity at the weekly scale had predictable effects on phytoplankton morphological trait-based groups and that different taxa were associated with deep and shallow biomass peaks according to traits. Finally, our uncertainty analysis study emphasized that considering the traits of our focal cyanobacterium was helpful in guiding both model development and potential future improvements to improve phytoplankton predictions. Additionally, these studies demonstrate that phytoplankton depth distributions and community composition are related and that global change stressors can affect phytoplankton community composition via changes in the spatial distribution of phytoplankton biomass. We found that depth distributions of different phytoplankton groups were consistently different across 51 lakes, varying along a gradient of global change stressors, such as light attenuation and thermal stratification, and that communities in deep and shallow biomass peaks differed over time due to thermal, thermocline deepening manipulations that were designed to simulate the effect of increased frequency and intensity of storms. Because different phytoplankton taxa have different effects on water quality, these changes in community composition due to changes in biomass depth distributions represent a potentially new dimension of global change effects on water quality. Our research also reiterates that short-term phytoplankton dynamics are difficult to predict. This is not a new finding, but our research suggests that consideration of both antecedent conditions and phytoplankton traits can help improve these short-term predictions. Findings from three of the studies I've presented support this conclusion. So first, the results of whole ecosystem mixing experiments during a single summer indicated that consideration of seasonal timing or antecedent conditions may be important for predicting phytoplankton responses at the weekly scale, as we saw variable responses of total phytoplankton biomass to mixing events within a season. We also observed different mechanisms of mixing effects on phytoplankton at different temporal scales, as mixing responses within a season were related to sediment suspension and uh, a resulting nutrient subsidy, while mixing responses at the multi-annual scale were related to changes in thermocline depths, thus affecting nutrient depth distributions. And finally, the dominance of model process uncertainty in near-term phytoplankton forecasts suggests that consideration of cyanobacterial traits should guide development of models to improve short-term phytoplankton predictions. Overall, the take-home message I'd like to leave you with is that consideration of phytoplankton community dynamics is critical for water management under global change. Much freshwater phytoplankton research relies on surface samples, samples at a single fixed depth or aggregated across depth, or measures of total biomass only. And this research demonstrates that global change uh, stressors can affect phytoplankton spatial distributions in addition to total biomass and community composition, and that different phytoplankton have different responses to different global change stressors. Um, so to effectively manage water resources in an era of global change, we have to know the players and we have to consider these phytoplankton groups, their traits and community structure to ensure good water quality in the future. So to conclude, I just want to quickly note that this take home is the inspiration for my current postdoc work, which Dr. Ledoux alluded to at the beginning, um, which is co-supervised by Kaylin Carey and Quinn Thomas at Virginia Tech. And so within a larger interdisciplinary collaborative team that is working to develop near-term water quality forecasts, I'm specifically going to be working on developing near-term or 1 to 16-day forecasts for phytoplankton functional groups in Falling Creek Reservoir, with the eventual aim of delivering these forecasts to the Western Virginia Water Authority um, to support their management decision making. 
And so for this project, I'll be working with open source forecasting tools and models, such as the Forecasting Lake and Reservoir Ecosystems tool, or FLARE, developed by Quinn Thomas and collaborators, as well as a coupled hydrodynamic water quality model called GLM AED, also developed collaborative, uh, collaboratively, but I'm showing uh, Matt Hipsey from the University of Western Australia here as a primary developer. This research is not too preliminary of a stage for me to share it today, because this is a new position, but I'm very excited about it and I hope to be sharing it. So with that, I'd like to once again thank all of the folks that have provided me with research opportunities, funding and moral support in conducting this research, as well as you all for attending today and take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you for a great talk, Mary, that was really, Wonderful, and you're getting lots of very positive things coming through on the chat. Um, but there are a couple questions listed here. One um, from fairly early in the talk was a question um, about how water pressure might influence the phytoplankton distribution in the water column. Water pressure? Yeah, so the question is, is pressure a variable with respect to phytoplankton distribution? Um, so it, it can be in the sense of um, maintaining that buoyancy. Um, phytoplankton will sort of take adv uh, advantage of um, sort of internal air sacs to regulate where they are in the water column um, with respect to pressure. Um, we're not talking about incredibly deep water columns um, for most of the lakes and reservoirs that I presented. And so probably what you're going to run out of first is light um, before pressure becomes a huge factor, but it's certainly important in terms of that buoyancy regulation. So that leads into the next question with what was the range of lake depths you were looking at, both thermocline depth and lake maximum depth? Yeah, and, and this was a really tricky thing to figure out how to handle, um, particularly in the Quebec Lake study. So it was ranging from a few meters, like three to four meters, to 70 or 80 meters. So a huge range. And actually, um, it, I didn't show nearly all the figures from that paper, but we actually did end up grouping the lakes into sort of shallower lakes and deeper lakes um, and talking about them separately because you'll tend to see the relative depth of the thermocline be much shallower in a deep lake because they've got a huge region of the water column that is that cold hypolimnetic water. Um, and the light penetration is, is, is not penetrating as deeply into the water column as well. And so we did end up teasing that a little bit apart in the paper, um, but there was a pretty big range and it did present some methodological challenges in terms of standardizing depth across lakes and interpreting how the phytoplankton distributions were changing. Yeah. I saw a question, I think, in the chat. Yeah, about yeah. Um, a wonderful presentation, but I noted that you avoided consideration of changes in the spectral distribution of light with depth, as seen in many marine studies, perhaps photo inhibition of some species near the surface and loss of red wavelengths with increasing depth. Yes. So this is a major. Um, <sighs> I love, I love the sensors that we use to get these high frequency depth distributions and they have some major caveats and that you've nailed the major one, um, which, well, one of the two major ones, which is that we, we do not get a really great picture of probably the top 20 to 30 um, uh, centimeters at least of the water column. Um, and so a lot of times, um, you will have photo inhibition that's occurring at those depths and that's affecting the, the fluorescence measurements that you're getting back due to changes in the, in the concentration of pigments and whatnot. Um, so that's one of the major caveats. The other major caveat of these sensors is that they are using the fluorescence at particular wavelengths as a proxy um, for biomass. And um, there's just variability in pigment concentrations among taxa and over time, even within a single taxon. And so those caveats have to be sort of taken into account when you're working with that type of data. Um, with that said, the benefit of that particular type of sensor data and why I focused on it so much here is because it is one of the few um, 
ways that we have to get really highly resolved depth distributions of phytoplankton biomass um, that have some amount of um, taxonomic resolution without being incredibly labor intensive and taking like a grab sample for microscope identification at every half meter, for example, which gets um, really prohibitive in terms of the um, frequency of data that you can get um, pretty quickly. So it does absolutely, um, um, there are caveats with it. Um, a lot of times those sensors need to be calibrated for the particular water body that you're working in based on the amount of dissolved organic carbon or other factors. Um, but it's still, in my opinion, one of the best measures we have for these highly resolved depth distributions. I'm going to read another question that's a little long. Um, let's see, you focused on trait differences between broad taxonomic groups of phytoplankton. Mm -hmm. Are there big enough differences between species within these broad groups that species traits are of interest? And if so, would the physical drivers, nutrients, temperature, light, affect species diversity with possible feedbacks onto resilience of the broader community? Yeah, so I think um, there's a lot in that question. So I'll start with the first part and I may need you to repeat the second bit as I go on. But um, so yes, these are really broad taxonomic groups. And yes, there's definitely species within the groups that have traits that are substantially different. One really interesting example of that um, from our interpretation was in the Quebec Lakes study we saw that increases in light attenuation led to overall narrower biomass peaks for total biomass, but actually broader biomass peaks for green algae. And I really scratched my head for a long time over that result. And one thing when we dug into some of the taxonomic data that Bees Lab had collected to ground truth the sensor data was that we saw that some of the green algae taxa were these like mixotrophic modal green algae and others were not. They were sort of the typical green algae profile that I presented highlight loving um, green algae. And so I interpreted what, what we ended up interpreting that result to mean was that when light attenuation increased, the modal taxa that could metabolize organic matter moved deeper, the ones that couldn't moved shallower or stayed where they were. Um, and that led to an overall broadening of the biomass peak with respect to green algae. Um, so yes, there could definitely be different responses to global change stressors. And I'm not sure if I captured the second part of that question though, Shannon. Um, so you, you kind of, I think you did. If uh, okay. with the physical drivers of these, um, affect species diversity if the species traits were important with possible feedbacks to resilience of the broader community. Yeah, and I think the resilience piece is interesting because functionally some of those species are operating pretty differently. Um, so it sort of depends on what you're, whether you're looking for like a, the resilience of a particular function that the species is performing um, or, or kind of resilience of um, species richness, for example. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, okay. So there's, to your answers, there's some overlap here. Um, so, okay, so it's actually noon. And so we're gonna sign off soon, but I'm gonna give you one more question that kind of is an opportunity to do hand waving and <laughs> so which concepts from your research do you think are most transferable to following, to flowing, well-mixed waters? Yeah, um, that's, a really, that's a really good question because a lot of this is very focused on, on stratified water columns. Um, so I think that functionally what we're talking about is when you think about, um, a lot of what I've been focusing on is thinking about these sort of micro, these smaller environments that occur within the stratified water column. You know, there's more nutrients here. There's a different temperature here. And I think that we do see a lot of that in, in flowing well-mixed water bodies. I'm teaching freshwater ecology right now. And so, and I'm talking about riffles and runs and pools within streams and sort of the different um, macroinvertebrate communities that those support and that we would expect um, those distributions to change um, as global change pressures affect sort of the presence of those micro environments. So that's probably um, maybe potentially because I was lecturing 
on that topic this morning. That's probably what comes to mind. Um, but yeah, I, I, I really, I appreciate that point. But yeah, the connection between the two is important. Great. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful presentation, well delivered and very interesting. And um, Matt will be able to share the list of questions that, that we had. So if your question wasn't answered here, Mary will receive a copy of it and you can find Dr. Lofton's email uh, at our website or on the Virginia Tech um, site. She is easy to find. And again, thank you very much for everyone thank for you. coming and thank you, Dr. Lofton, for a great talk. Thank you.